Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in, in again. This is our final lecture for Shooting in the Dark. Um, we're going to dive right in today with um, a little bit of question and answer and review of some of the student projects from this past week. So I just have to say, first of all, um, completely blown away by the work everyone did. Like, really, I was not expecting this. Um, there are a lot of you who really know what you're doing, and so it's just great for me um, as a photographer myself to be able to um, absorb some of this and learn from you all. Um, it should be great for everyone else who's taking the class to, to see this, to see all the creativity that's coming out of this, and um, all the different locations, different types of lighting, different styles of photography, really just a lot of great work that came out of this class. So that's exciting. Um, and keep it coming. Even though the class is ending today with this last lecture, it's going to live on online. So um, whatever you have, keep putting it up there. I'm going to be looking at it. Hopefully the other students will be looking at it. It's open to you. So um, that resource is there for you. Uh, so before we get to the student projects, I just want to go over some Q&A, um, some questions that came up uh, through Skillshare, through Twitter, through uh, my email that I think were important enough that um, I should address it here so everyone um, gets exposure to it and it's, it's going to help you um, in the future with your night photography. So let's go. Um, the first question has to do with night, photo night photography and portraiture. Um, I think a few of you, a bunch of you actually um, did try to take some portraits at night, which can be a challenge, and I only sort of touched upon how to do that exactly. Um, you know, and I had spent so much time focusing on long exposures and light trails and that sort of stuff, uh, but portraiture is a little bit different in the way you want to approach it, at least um, at its most basic level. So um, that said, if you were going to try a 30-second exposure um, or longer, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, a little bit shorter, but still fairly long, um, you're going to get motion blur. And so when you're shooting uh, somebody's portrait, you want to have their face really, really um, razor sharp um, because it's just going to read much better as a photograph and um, come across as a better portrait if the face is really in focus, in particular the eyes. With portraiture, you always want to try to focus on the eyes if you can. Um, so if you're doing a 30 second exposure, what happens? Well, the person, no matter how hard they try, um, it's going to be hard for them to stay perfectly still, particularly if, you're, if you have a really tight shot, if you're really up close, um, any little movement is going to show up. So um, that's not to say that you can't, it can't be done, but at its most basic level, I think with portraits, it's good to try to keep the exposures a bit shorter. So what you can do is um, instead of having um, uh, a shutter speed of like 30 seconds, um, you want to keep it to um, under a second, really closer to a 60th of a second, 80th of a second, something like that, where um, any blur is going to be, um, is not going to appear because the shutter speed is just so fast. So, um, and, and since we're talking about night photography, that can be a little tricky since obviously there's not a lot of light. If you're not using a flash, that makes it even harder. So uh, what I recommend is to bump your ISO up really high, um, as high as you can take uh, with the grain that's going to show up, depending on the camera you're using, the lens you're using, all that stuff. So um, for me, I'm, I have um, a nice camera, a nice Canon that um, you can pump the ISO pretty high, you know, 6400 even, and the grain is, is pretty variable. Um, and that's going to allow you to uh, shoot a, at a faster shutter speed. And, um, you know, you can open up your aperture pretty wide, if possible, again, with your camera and your lens. Um, let a little bit, little bit more light in um, and get just a really nice um, razor-sharp portrait. So when you're first starting out with that, I would try that way. Um, again, there's exceptions to every rule, and you can do long exposures with portraiture. You just have to kind of know what you're doing. Um, I saw a really great photo that came up today on my Tumblr uh, where um, this photographer shot a portrait in the snow in Brooklyn the other day and 
he used a flash shot through an umbrella and so he managed to freeze some of the action but have a little bit of blur so it was like he was using that blurry effect um, and that's that's a little bit more of an advanced example but you can definitely play around with that in the future but um, in the beginning just try to keep your shutter speed really fast okay so that's portraiture um, the next question that came up that I thought was really important and I wish I had addressed in the first lecture was the issue of focusing autofocus versus manual focus um, so what happens is and I think what many of you probably realized as you went out to shoot was um, when you're in autofocus and it's dark out um, your camera can have a really hard time figuring out what it needs to focus on um, because autofocus mechanisms are based on contrast so if there's just a lot of darkness then there's low contrast and the camera just doesn't know where to go so if you start to shoot and you feel like your camera is having trouble autofocusing or if you take a shot and it's focused somewhere way in the foreground when it should be in the background then you know you're having trouble with the autofocus so your options are to a, go into manual focus, easy enough, makes sense, right? And just manually focus on the point that you want in focus. Or the other thing you can do is if you're not quite sure and you're shooting um, a landscape, which is what a lot of you were shooting, um, you know, skylines, um, uh, rural landscapes where the subject is pretty far in the distance, you know, 20, 30 feet or more, um, then you can set your focal point to infinity on your lens and if you don't know what that is most lenses um, have uh, a distance indicator on one of the dials on, on the focus focal dials and one of those settings is infinity which is the symbol um, I'm sure most of you know which is the uh, like an eight that's on its side um, so you just set your focus there and then as long as you keep it there even though you're in manual it's going to have that infinity focus, which is really just um, a point past the farthest distance um, uh, before infinity, which might be like 10 or 15 feet or something like that. It just depends on the lens, but um, you can play around with that. Just make sure that you set your focus from auto to manual when you do that, and then you'll lock it in that way. So that's something that you, you do a lot of at night because you'll find that it's just... Uh, you know, it's easier, you're, you're shooting slower, you're on a tripod, you kind of want to make everything a little bit more manual, um, and that'll help you out a lot. Okay. Um, next question, uh, what type of lens you should use? I got this question um, quite a bit in various forms, um, and I think there's no really right or wrong answer to that. The question of what lens you should use in any form of photography a lot of times just comes down to personal preference um, and uh, you know it just depends like lenses can get expensive so if you don't have the best lens then you have to work with what you have which is fine um, but that said like good glass is going to make everything better so um, a really nice fast prime uh, you know with um, an aperture that can be opened up to 1.4 something like that um, I tend to prefer lenses that are a little bit wider so my main lens that I use on my Canon is a 35 millimeter f 1.4 um, so it's it's nice and fast and pretty wide um, so I use that for a lot of my night photography um, and it's just it's a really versatile lens because I can do it I can use it for um, like I was saying before like a portrait at night um, open the aperture up really wide and bump up the ISO and, um, and still get a nice wide view. So that's what I like, but that doesn't mean that that's what you have to use. Um, and this just this goes for night photography, photography and natural light, whatever. Like you just have to find what you're comfortable with. But in general, um, if you can spend a little bit more money on a nicer lens, then you're going to get better results. A lot of the what they call kit lenses, lenses that come with the camera kit when you buy a body plus lens, like an 18 to 55 millimeter, um, those lenses are um, not going to produce results um, as good as the prime. So they're going to be a little less sharp. Um, and when you're doing long exposures, that's going to show up a little bit more when you have um, ISO noise coming into play. So 
keep that in mind. Um, if photography is something you're serious about and you want to keep doing for a while, then a nice prime, um, I think would be really good. Um, and then finally, the last question that I wanted to address, um, that I think a lot of you are wondering about is, um, the issue of, uh, shooting with an iPhone or an Android phone and the apps you should be using. So I touched upon this a little bit, but, uh, I wanted to just point out specifically a couple, about a couple iPhone apps. Um, that's what I have the most experience with. I don't, uh, you know, to be honest, I don't have any experience with an Android app, uh, but I would imagine they're pretty similar. Um, and the thing you should keep in mind is that these, the cameras on these phones are not, they weren't designed to shoot um, long exposures and things like that, the stuff that we're talking about. So. Um, that's fine uh, because developers have come up, come up basically with hacks, you know, workarounds into the camera so that you can do it. Um, so you see a lot of these slow shutter apps. Um, there's one that's really popular for the iPhone called Average Cam Pro. Um, and basically they're just hacking into the camera's um, software and allowing you to shoot at different shutter speeds, um, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go into screen share here. I'm going to look at slow shutter cam. So I've just pulled up the page on the Apple App Store. Um, so you can see it. This is the one I think um, a lot of people use and find works really well, particularly for night photography. You can see they have examples here of obviously um, smoothing out the motion of a waterfall. Um, some light trails here. So, um, like I was saying, this is not really going into full manual mode like you would with the DSLR. It's close, but um, it's not quite there. So, what that means is you have to kind of learn the quirks, the intricacies of the app, and that means getting out there and shooting with it a lot and finding what you like and what you don't like because um, every app is going to be different. It's not like a DSLR where um, things are a little bit more standardized. Um, so in this particular one, Slow Shutter Cam, it gives you some options. These are just some of them here on this screen. There's more in this, these settings, but these are the main shooting options. So the one that I like and I've been successful with is Capture Mode Light Trail. Um, they have automatic and manual. I, I don't really know how they designate it, but the Light Trail one gives some of the best results I've seen. You can set your shutter speed. So you have half a second, one second, two, four, and on. So they're um, going up in stops. And B, which stands for bulb. And that just means once you press the uh, shutter button here, you can have the shutter open for as long as you hold down that button. So if you wanted to do more than 15 seconds or somewhere in between one of these, uh, you know, one and a half seconds, whatever you want to do. Um, that's there. They have these sensitivity settings here as well. So like I said, um, these apps are really quirky. Uh, you just have to play around with them and find what works. Um, and um, again, what I found successful is light trail. Um, whatever shutter speed you want to do depends on how, how much light you want to let in, how, much, how long you want your light trails to go on for, that sort of thing. And then they have, you know, like this one has this weird sort of um, post-processing they call it innovative freeze control. From what I understand, it just sort of changes the contrast of the image, so you can kind of do a little bit of post-production uh, right after you take the photo before you save it down to your camera roll. This sample photo here, um, frankly, I've never seen a slow shooter cam photo that was this solid, where the light trails are that smooth, but if you guys have examples where it's that smooth, I would love to see them because this looks really impressive to me, and um, I find it hard to get results quite that good with the iPhone app, but um, I could certainly be proven wrong. Um, and then, uh, as I said before, with the iPhone, there's another app called Average Cam Pro. So I think a lot of you are probably wondering um, if that's a good one to use. Average Cam Pro is um, a great app for long exposures. It's not so great for long exposures at night. 
So once you get past uh, once you get past the last little light of um, coming from the sun, so just after sunset, going into twilight, as soon as it gets dark, um, Average Cam Pro doesn't work so well. So if you're if it's during the day, if it's at sunset, sunrise, whatever, you have a lot of light being let into the camera. Um, you can get some really really stunning photos. Um, you know, if you're on the water, you can really get that super silky, glassy looking water. Um, I've just seen some amazing stuff with that. So um, that's a little bit different. Um, not quite the topic of this class, but certainly it's a great app. If you're shooting at night, long exposures on an iPhone, slow shutter cam is what I recommend. Um, again, all the same rules apply. You want to use a tripod. Keep it super steady because if your sh shutter speed is uh, slower than half a second or more, then you're going to get some um, uh, getting a tweet that the YouTube app on iPad doesn't show the stream. Interesting. So if you're on an iPad, I apologize about that, but just found that out. So hopefully everything's working fine again. Seems to be going a little bit smoother this time. Anyway, um, uh, that is I guess that's it for the question and answer. So um, again, I'm, I'm here for you as a resource. If you have any questions at all, um, keep them coming. I'm going to keep answering them online through the Skillshare class. Um, if you want to email me, keep emailing me, chrisozer at gmail.com, Twitter, chrisozer, whatever. You know, you guys paid for this class, so I really want you to feel like um, you're getting what you hope to get out of it. And um, I want to help answer whatever questions you have, or even if you just want, um, you want to check out, you want me to check out some photos that you took um, later on down the road, I'm happy to, to look at them and give some feedback. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and dive into the student projects, which were just incredible. Seriously, um, really great stuff. So, First one that I want to pull up. Let me go back to screen share. Um, some photos from Dan Cohen, who lives in San Francisco. I mean, as you can see here, I um, hope you guys got a chance to check this out already, but just absolutely breathtaking views. Um, a lot of you included your um, settings, which I think is, is great particularly for the purpose of learning. Um, these settings reveal a lot. So you see his focal length, his aperture, his shutter speed, and his ISO. That can tell you so much about a photo. And um, if the photographer is willing to give you that information and you have both the image and the settings, that tells you pretty much everything you need to know because you can kind of figure out the lighting from there, all that stuff. So um, thank you to, the, to those of you that included that. It's very helpful. Um, and I think it's good for you as the photographer to go back and look at that later on down the road. Um, this one in particular just stood out to me. Uh, let's see, why is this Does that help? Not really. Um, anyway, um, so much detail here I'm looking at on um, my computer, my bigger screen here now for the first time. And just you can just see all this detail in the houses here. Everything in the background, obviously, just perfectly sharp. Um, Dan's using a, a great camera, I think a Mark, uh, Canon 5D Mark II, um, which is just going to give you such a high dynamic range and um, just capture a lot of that detail. So again, you know, he's got some great gear. It's going to make a difference. So you know, even if you went out there and your, you, your camera wasn't quite as nice as what he had and you shot the exact same scene, um, your results are going to vary. So you have to keep that in mind. Like you are at times limited by your gear. Um, that's not to say that the eye isn't really important, but um, he's got some great gear and it, it shows here and he's got a great eye too. So um, really, really nice photos, Dan. Some more stuff here. I love this bridge. Nice lines. Um, really cool ambient, ambient light there. So great stuff. Um, Next one I wanted to talk about is from Yalin, who did some cool stuff with the iPhone, which kudos to that. 
that's really awesome. Um, the iPhone can take some great night photos, but the one in particular, and some DSLR stuff too, one in particular I liked was this one, which he shot with his iPhone 4S. Um, so everything I talked about at the beginning of that first lecture um, is present here. Strong subject, person right here in the middle of the frame. Lines, so nice composition leading right to the person. I think these are, it's really cool how these um, double yellow lines kind of converge here. Um, and then you have the symmetrical lights here. Um, great mood coming from the fog, kind of diffusing the light a little bit. Um, you know, really gives a, a sense of the place and um, what was going on. So I uh, just really love this. Love the fact that it was taken with an iPhone. Great work. Um, the next one, and just by coincidence, I'm kind of going in order here. But these were ones that I, I thought really stood out. It's from Scott Williams. Um, so something I wanted to address uh, that I think probably a lot of you find out, found out, I saw this theme sort of repeating itself, was when you're shooting light trails like this, like the classic uh, middle of the highway shot where you have the white lights on one side and the red lights on the other side, um, these two, I, I can't pick a favorite, they're both, they're both great. I'll just click on this one here. Um, something that you, I think a lot of you find out was when you're shooting these highway light trail shots, for them to be really effective, uh, the more traffic you have, the better, and the faster the traffic is going, the better. So if you think about that, if you're doing a 30 second exposure and one car goes by, then you're gonna get the light trails from one car, um, which is fine. Uh, but if you're going for this type of shot, um, it's going to be all the more powerful if you have a lot of traffic going really fast. You just get this great sense of motion, um, and it's kind of just filling up the whole uh, um, road here. So that's something to think about. And, um, you know, you might go out there and think you have the perfect location, lighting's good, you know all your settings on your camera, and then you get there, and there's just not enough traffic. And that's something you can't control. Um, it, it can be a bummer, but... Um, Think about that, you know, that's that's part of being a photographer is being in the right place at the right time. Um, and the more you, experience you have, the better you will be prepared to go to the right place at the right time so you'll know, okay, I'm shooting light trails, I need a lot of traffic, I need the light to be like this, et cetera, et cetera. All those tools that you have in your head um, that prepare you, all those steps that you take to get to the shot, even before you take it, are just as important as everything you do when you're actually snapping the shot. Um, so all the really great photographers, it's some, it's the stuff that you don't see, all of them, all the setup to get there. Um, so this was great, uh, great example from, from Scott of um, getting a lot of light trails from all the traffic. Um, next one from Olivier who had, he posted a ton of stuff. Some really cool creative images here. Here's a portrait. A little bit of light painting, love that. Um, some stars, he, he pointed out here, which what I thought was really interesting was, um, here are some more shots, lessons learned. Don't shoot long exposures when storm is near. Yeah, a lot of you, um, uh, had problems with the rain, with, with shooting in the rain. It seems like it was raining everywhere in the world this week, <laughs> which was unfortunate um, for your night photography. But yeah, it can be tough um, if you're getting water in your lens and you're shooting 30 second exposures, you gotta constantly wipe it off because um, that can cause a lot of problems. Um, not only with your camera and the gear obviously, but just um, getting the image right. Um, and then also, 20 to 30 seconds for him was too long for fixed stars and too short for um, nice star trails. So uh, with these 20 to 30, 30 second exposures, he was getting just a little bit of movement in the stars here. You see, that's not camera shake because this is, the building is perfectly in focus. Um, these are the stars actually moving um, just a little bit. Um, so if you want them where there are sharp points of light, he would have had to have gone a little bit slower 
I'm sorry, um, a little bit faster with the shutter speed. Um, and so that's, I liked how Olivier pointed that out. It's something uh, he learned by taking this shot, and now he probably knows next time he goes, he'll, he'll do it a different way. So that's part of all of this is trial and error. If you mess it up and you get it wrong, a lot of times that's the best thing that can happen for you because you know, okay, I'm not going to do that next time. I'm going to do this. So that's great. I like that he pointed that out. Um, but the thing I really liked about Olivier's photos was this particular one um, because to me it disproves the last rule I stated about light trails was that you needed a lot of traffic for them to be effective. Here, I think this single, it's one, maybe two cars going by. I'm not totally sure. I'd have to ask him. But um, I just love how there's this slight curve here um, going along with the road. Um, it just fits in really nicely with the composition and the colors, the gray, the blue, blues and reds. Um, just a really nice set of colors here. Um, and I just love all the curves. It's a really great shot. And I love that there's just that single light trail there that's kind of painting a little bit of light on the road, um, giving that sense of movement and direction and drawing your eye in. So really cool photo. Love that one. OK. And going down the line here. Um, just a bunch of great shots here from Adonis. Um, nice portrait here, lit by this bright pure light. I think that's in Long Island City. Great spot. Some nice stuff from Brooklyn Heights. I um, love this bench shot. And you know, you have the nice polka in the background. Um, some leading lines from the bench here. Nice uh, choice of where to place the focus right here, right in the middle, so your eye is drawn right to that. Great shot. And then I love that he shot with film a little bit. Um, I think in this um, um, you know, digital age, it's great to go back and um, shoot with film and, and see the results you can get. Um, so he had a bunch of shots here with film. So you guys should definitely check him out if you haven't already. Um, great work. Okay, next one that I thought was really cool. Some shots from Dean Gray in Tokyo. Uh, this one, he was using some slightly more advanced techniques. He used a flash here in a couple different spots uh, to get the, I think I was reading, to get the face lit at first, and then he went behind the subject to light with the flash a little bit, but then also this nice light trail here um, shaping the subject. Very cool shot, very creative. Some other nice landscapes, a little more, more light painting. So great work from Dean. Uh, next one. Let's see. I love these two from Nicholas Pritchett. Um, Really, um, just a simple, simple photograph, and I mean that in the best sense. Um, simple is hard to do, and um, I think Nicholas did it really well here. Uh, just one single light, lighting the whole scene, um, gives the subject a nice silhouette. Um, he did it in black and white, which is great. Um, really, just um, you know, your eyes drawn right here, straight to the subject. Great mood. Um, really like everything about it, and I like that the um, subject is posed maybe a little bit, but also it still feels very natural. Nice um, uh, a gate that he's ca captured here from the subject. So um, that's something to think about with your with your portraits is trying to get that really natural um, pose. It can be hard because people are very self conscious when they're in front of the camera. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, it's a subtle thing, but it makes a big difference. And then another nice portrait here. If you can see it, oh, it's getting cut off. So um, there's another one here. Um, nice use of just using available light. You don't need a lot. Um, you can get away with, with 
with the light that you have around you. So Nicholas proves that there. Great stuff. Again, just scrolling through these, I'm just, it's just awesome. Um, again, please keep it coming. I love looking at them. If I haven't replied, um, I, I will reply. I'm going through all of them. Um, uh, there's just a lot, but I, I do, uh, I do want to see everything and I will, um, reply to everyone. So please keep posting them. Um, even after tonight. Uh, Jean-Philippe Belly in France, and I apologize if I'm murdering any of your names. Um, it happens with my last name all the time, so I uh, feel bad about that, but I just want to say I'm sorry. Uh, I, I love this photo from Jean-Philippe. Really great. Um, it's a self-portrait. Awesome. Um, but they're not easy to do. And um, he just, he pulled it off great here. He found this little bit of light. Again, just finding some available light in an alley. It's just enough. Um, gives it a little bit of a mysterious mood. There's lots of blacks. But light in just the right places. Um, casts a really nice silhouette. Um, he, here's another example of a great pose. Just putting your leg, leg up against a wall like that. Um, just a simple little thing. Makes all the difference. So great self-portrait from Jean-Philippe. He has some other great stuff in here. Nice lines in this one. Nice symmetry. Um, parking lots. Something about them. They're just they're great for photography. You wouldn't think it, but this is really cool. I love the coolness of the lights here and all the texture um, on the floor and in the ceiling. Like all those little details. Um, think about that when you're looking at locations. Like that's what photographers are thinking about, and they. Um, um, a good photographer will do a good job of getting that across, and John Philippe did that really well here. Um, just love these colors and textures. Good stuff. Uh, let's see. Looking for one. Where is it? Matt, Matt Osler. Um, this is this first one that he posted that I wanted to talk about. Um, something very simple that um, you should think about every time you shoot at night, whenever. Do you shoot in portrait or do you shoot in landscape? So do you hold the camera vertically or do you hold it horizontally? Um, he chose here to hold it vertically, and I think it suits the scene really well because you have these lines going straight down the middle, even these lights kind of fading off here. All those little things um, fit very nicely with this format, in my opinion. Um, it's not easy to capture um, photos well in portrait, and I think this is a good example of when you should do that. It suits the scene, so that's what you have to think about. Does shooting in portrait suit this scene? And here it does. Obviously, lots of other great stuff going on. Um, the fog, light trails, lights from the bridge. Um, Matt replied to a comment that I made saying that this was a really um, uh, highly photographed location. I don't think I've seen it before, or if I have, I haven't seen it like this. So to me, that that does it for me. You know, I'm seeing something for the first time. So. Uh, great job with doing that, Matt. That's what a photographer should aim to do. Love that photo. Um, and I think lastly, the last one that I wanted to highlight for you guys, if I can find it. Andrew Kim, another San Franciscan. Lots of great stuff here. Nice landscape, um, nice symmetry and lines in this shot. Love this one. 
um, capturing the photographer in the moment. And then there's a really nice portrait here um, with some great lighting. Again, a great mood. A lot of these night photos, you're going to get that sort of mysterious vibe, um, you know, faces that are sort of halfway lit, and then you get these really rich shadows. Um, so Andrew did just um, a great job with this one. Really love this. Nice composition, nice colors. Um, and this is, these, these types of photos are um, uh, not easy to do. It's hard to shoot people. It's hard to get their expressions to look natural, and it can be dis it can be um, it can be the uh, uh, sort of hard to do as a photographer because you think it's going to be easy, and then it's not. So um, keep going with that. That's something I'm working on myself is trying to get better with portraiture. So I, for me, I love looking at them because I'm I'm studying them all the time. So this was a, a great example for me of how to take a good portrait at night. Um, and something Andrew pointed out um, in his comments here, I have to have a little bit of night photography. Night photography. Um, what really stuck with me was the idea of making sure that the subject is clear and concrete. So that's the first thing. Um, you know, you have a lot to think about when you're shooting at night. Um, all the settings. Um, your shutter speed, your aperture, all that stuff, and you can get really weighed down with that. So um, don't let that supersede the fact that you're still taking a photo and you're telling a story visually. Um, and the way you try to get better at that is to focus on those things I talked about in the first lecture about um, having a really strong subject, good composition, and good lighting. Um, you need that. So. Um, I like seeing a little bit, little, little bit of that in the student projects. Um, so, thank you, everyone. And this has been really great. It's been great for me. I feel like um, I've learned a lot that I can go out there and shoot and um, keep these ideas in the back of my head all the time. Um, so, for me, this has been uh, really special, and I love seeing these projects. Again, please keep them coming. I'm going to be checking them out. Um, if you don't want to upload it there, if you have something that you're just not comfortable sharing with publicly, I totally understand that. Um, you can email me your photos. Again, chrisozer at gmail.com. I'll check them out. I'm happy to give you feedback. Um, but um, if you can uh, post them and get some feedback from people, that's going to be really helpful. Um, so thanks again. Um, shoot me questions on Skillshare, email, Twitter, whatever. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing more of your photos, and um, talk to you later. Bye.